those of you who are married to narcissists or in committed relationships with narcissists have already experienced urban warfare. <laughs> so maybe there's nothing new I can tell you. But more seriously, Israel has invaded Gaza yesterday. The forces are still there. It is not clear whether this is the invasion that Israel has been promising or threatening with in the past three weeks. But at any rate, there are forces inside Gaza and they are beginning to get involved in what is known as urban warfare. How is urban warfare different to other types of fighting? And what are the psychological implications of urban warfare? warfare? This is the topic of today's video. And yes, it is based on a few weeks of personal experience with urban warfare in the first few months of my three and a half year service in the Israeli Defense Forces. So unfortunately, I'm bringing personal insight into this as well as many other studies, analysis by military experts, by army psychologists, trauma experts, and so on and so forth. I've distilled everything, put everything together as I usually do, and to give you a, as complete a picture of the aftermath, psychological aftermath, of fighting within dense human populations, door to door, room to room, house to house, hand to hand, face to face, you and the other person and only one of you will come out alive. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I'm a former visiting professor of psychology in Southern Federal University in Russia. I'm currently a longtime member of the faculty of SIAPS, Commonwealth for International Advanced Professional Studies, Cambridge, United Kingdom, Toronto, Canada, and an outreach campus in Lagos, Nigeria. Legalities aside, let us delve right into the urban landscape. First, don't try this at home with your significant other. <laughs> I'm going to describe the features, the military features of urban warfare, and then I'm going to move on in the second half of the video, I'm going to move on to psychological an analysis of the psychological impacts of urban warfare on mostly the attacker, the military that is initiating the urban warfare. Now, first of all, the vast majority of armies in the world are not built for urban combat. Most armies in the world focus on what is known as combi combined arms maneuvers or combined arms, arms maneuver warfare, which is the Air Force, the infantry, tanks, the Navy, all acting together and creating an envelope, a containing envelope, mostly for infantry soldiers. The aim of traditional conventional armies is to overwhelm an enemy by concentrating speed and mass at critical points with an element of surprise. So modern armies are highly mobile and they transfer forces where the enemy does not anticipate. And the idea is to break through defenses and flanks of the enemy and somehow perhaps to surround the enemy, at any rate, to break the resistance of the enemy. Now this has been going on since Alexander the Great and Napoleon and others. So there's nothing new in any of this. But this is doubly so with modern armies, modern militaries that include heavy weight elements such as tanks or fighter planes and, and so on. But in cities, all the above means nothing. All the above is actually a disadvantage. The bigger the force that infiltrates a city, the easier a target it becomes. So cities force you to break down into smaller and smaller and smaller units, sometimes only two people. And you have to move slowly through side streets because moving through a main thoroughfare, through a main street, big street, 
is seriously flawed, is seriously wrong. You move through side streets, through gates, shortcuts, above roofs, and, and so on and so forth, in order to reach your destination. And this cannot be done with 20,000 people. So you naturally end up breaking up to tinier and tinier units. And you cannot, with such a small force, overwhelm defenders, overwhelm your enemy. You can do this in a forest, you can do this in a desert, you can do this in a field, but you can't do this in a built environment. And the irony is, the more buildings you destroy, the more defenses you provide to your enemy. Because rubble is optimal. Ruins can be booby-trapped and serve as concrete covers. So you're creating, in effect, your enemy's defenses by bombing buildings from the air, as Israel has been doing for three weeks now. So you move in small units, you're much more likely to end up in an ambush or a killing zone. Actually, a well-prepared enemy channels your movement, makes sure that you can move only along a certain axis or a conduit or a venue so that you end up where they want you to end up and then they kill you and then they kill you again. The enemy is hidden. You have to constantly guess. Surprises are the only unsurprising thing. Surprises are the only guaranteed thing. And it's very shocking. It's a constantly, it's a percussion, it's a constantly shocking environment. And it involves hand-to-hand -hand combat, face-to-face, eye-to-eye. You smell the sweat of the enemy. You look into their eyes, their pupils dilating. You see the veins in their necks pulsating. It's very, very intimate. It's very intimate. Some people even say erotically charged. It's a life and death dance repeated over and over and over again until you die. Because your chances to die in urban warfare are much, much higher than in open warfare. The enemy is everywhere. It is underground. It is on the ground. It shoots at you from tops of buildings. So this is a three-dimensional death envelope. You're enveloped by death and destruction. And you begin to develop the belief that you're doomed, that there's no way out of this. And so you begin to behave accordingly, as we'll talk about it later. Sometimes you become much less care careful and cautious than you should be, defiant, in your face, defying death, you know. It's a grind. Urban warfare is a grind. There's no clear end, well-defined goals, mission success, mission statement, horizon. It feels like it could last forever. You start with, an army starts usually with shaping, shaping operations, preparing the ground. And then urban warfare follows in the form of invading the territory and invasion. But all the advantages in urban warfare accrue to the defender. Urban warfare is bloody, it's slow, it's complex. That's why it's known in military jargon as the great equalizer. It equalizes the poorly, the poorly equipped, poorly trained defenders with the highly equipped, highly trained attackers. It equalizes because the defender knows the terrain much better than you do. And so they can counterattack in very, very unexpected ways. And there's always civilian collateral damage. Civilian casualties are absolutely inevitable. Inevitable. And that makes you, the attacker, the bad guy. Even if you are fighting a terrorist organization, such as ISIS or Hamas, which is indistinguishable from ISIS, even then, you are the bad guy. Because you end up killing babies and children and pregnant women and women who could have become pregnant had you not killed them. 
so you become the bad guy. And there's no way to avoid this because terrorists fight from within populated urban areas. And they very frequently use the population, the civilian population, as human shields. They maintain their headquarters, their warehouses, their munition dumps, their launching pads, everything within hospitals and mosques and schools and kindergartens and shopping malls. That's a fact. That's a fact in Gaza as well, where major hospitals are actually the headquarters of Hamas operations. And so civilians are going to die. Civilians are going to die. And the idea is to somehow push the defenders or the terrorists or whatever you want to call them, somehow push them into a, sin, a, a demar demarcated location, a boundary location, and besiege them in these pockets. But these sieges can last like years. Remember Stalingrad? They can last years. So this engenders a siege mentality. It is like static trench warfare. Only trench warfare is in open fields. And this is trench warfare where even the trenches are invisible and shape-shifting. So there's a siege mentality of both the attacker and the defender. They both feel under siege. Now, you don't take prisoners in urban warfare. Anyone moves, you kill them. You kill everyone in sight. Yes, I know. This is a, cr this is a crime of war. This is a crime against humanity. And no military commander would admit to it, and no military, no army would admit to it. But this is how it's done. It's done this way because a prisoner with his hands up could be booby-trapped. A child coming out of a tunnel could carry a Kalashnikov. You don't play games. You don't take chances. You don't speculate and second-guess. You shoot first. You ask questions later. So this is total warfare. And as a soldier, you end up killing children. You end up killing women. You end up killing civilians who are somehow allied with the defenders or the terrorists or whatever, clearly allied with them because they emerge with them or from their hiding places. And this is devastating, mentally devastating. Even during the Holocaust, there have been Nazi soldiers and Nazi commanders and very high level commanders who went bonkers, who went insane, having had to shoot civilian population on a regular basis. Now, most or modern urban warfare, warfare is carried out at night. It's a night operation because the attacker, which is usually a, a regular conventional army, has superiority of night vision technologies. So, most of these attacks are at night. The warfare is asymmetrical in terms of technology, material, supplies, munition, air cover, and so on. And this asymmetry is at its peak at night, where the attacking soldiers can see pretty well, and the defending ones are blinded by the darkness. All kinds of assets are used in modern urban warfare. I'm talking about drones, I'm talking about robots, and this renders the fighting impersonal, mechanical, automated, robotic. The assets are airborne, or they lead, or they are involved in land warfare. To clear rooms, for example, you would send a drone into the room, you send a robot into the, the room, and blow them up if you see someone there. So. It's all very kind of video game. War is a video game. When you blow up a building in a contested urban warfare zone, it's exactly like shooting someone in a video game. And it dehumanizes. It dehumanizes or objectifies the other person. They're no longer human beings. They are just characters in a video game. And we've seen this in the recordings released by WikiLeaks, recordings of, of pilots, American pilots and others, 
fighting, um, bombing humans, but treating them exactly as characters in video games. Now, even in urban warfare, there is a place for combined arms maneuvers. Infantry and commando units guide pilots, fighter pilots, bombers, navy and artillery as to where to direct the fire. But this leads to a lot of friendly fire incidents. And so, in truth, fighters in urban warfare prefer not to. <laughs> They use air, air power and artillery and so on uh, only very, very rarely and scarcely because they're terrified of their own, <laughs> of their own military. You're on your own. In urban warfare, you are all alone. No one can help you. No one has your back. It's you and only you. There's been an interview that I read with with um, a top Ukrainian commander, Kevlyuk. And he said that the heavily armed forces are followed by isolation forces. So you first to devastate, destroy the whole area, and then the next echelon, next round, next wave of army comes in um, and kind of cleans. It's, these are the cleaners, the clean after. And he said, the assault echelon carries with it a double supply of hand grenades, disposable gra grenade launchers, jet flamethrowers, anti-tank missiles, man pads. Combat medics in armored evacuation vehicles wait at a distance of visual communication, just in case they're needed. He says, never walk the streets. Yards, private buildings, holes in fences and walls are the way to victory. He said that everything should be close by, the logistics, the medical units, the UAVs, the, the unmanned aerial vehicles, the crucials, the drones, and the commander of the force, so the assault force, should be in control of what these drones are doing, as well as feeding bomber pilots and fighter pilots with exact coordinates, pinpointed coordinates in real time. So. Airplanes are always above head, waiting to attack, and they usually do so within seconds. Kevliuk mentions something very important, which leads us segues into the second part of this video, which is the psychology. He says, urban warfare is personal responsibility. He says, if you don't have something in battle, if you miss something, it's your fault. Ballistic protection, a first aid kit, a tourniquet, preferably two. You must have these things. When you pack your backpack, says Kevliuk, an extra pack of cartridges is much better than a can of food. Everyone should clearly identify their combat tasks. They should know who is acting to the right and to the left of you. They should know how to contact the commander, the combat medic or the sapper. Sapper is a combat military engineer. And this is the crucial element in urban warfare and the key to understanding the extreme psychological impacts of urban warfare. You are absolutely responsible for what's happening to you. If there's no one to blame, it's your fault, 100%. And no one has your back and no one supports you, and you're on your own, and it's life and death, and it's hand to hand, and it's knife to, be to belly, and it's just that the way it is. And you must survive at all costs. And this, of course, creates post-traumatic stress disorder in many veterans of urban warfare, anywhere between 10 and 40 percent, depending on the severity of the battle. And this is lifelong. The PTSD is lifelong. The sights in urban warfare are nothing like what you see in regular battle. Nothing. The civilians, the babies, the slaughtered mothers, the body parts, the charred bodies, the surprises, the shocks, the explosions, the knives in the back, 
your own people firing on you by mistake. I mean, it is absolutely devastating. And that's why very few soldiers can survive more than a week or two or three in urban warfare. And most urban warfare winds up in days. Or there is a kind of uh, rotation involved. Because the attrition rate is enormous. You see, there's, in urban warfare, very often, there's no movement, no discernible movement. And there's no way to define your accomplishments. It's like a bit of a frozen scene. It's very surreal, very nightmarish. And gruesome death, gruesome forms of death, are your constant companion. The stench, the, vis the visuals, the... There, you, you wake up to it, you go to sleep to it, if you catch some sleep, very few are able to sleep, and, and this becomes your scenery, this becomes your life, this becomes your environment. And you don't hesitate to step on bodies, to eat next to a decapitated head or a dead baby, you get desensitized. Every, the enemy becomes so many body parts, totally dehumanized. By the way, there's the same effect in, in the medical profession. Medical doctors often describe the same effect, especially in specific departments like emergency, emergency rooms and ICUs and so on. You need to reduce the human form to an organ or a body part in order to survive, simply to survive. And there's a constant sense of abandonment, constant sense of isolation oh my god i've lost my units or i'm stuck with only one body and he's wounded this constant sense of wandering off and never being able to find your way back it's very primordial it's like a tiny tiny infant in a shopping in a giant shopping mall having lost his or her mother there's extreme dependency on other people so there's an external locus of control you feel that your life is determined from the outside and there's nothing much you can do about it. The next explosion, the next mine, the next booby trap, the next knife in the back, the next attack, the next terrorist, the next defender, the next whatever, freedom fighter, whatever you want to call them. Where from? Up, down, under, this room, that room, rubble, this child, this woman, what? You're constantly on, on, on the alert. It's a, it's a flight of fight response taken to extremes. And the, this external locus of control is a form of surrender. You give up on your life, in effect. You move, continue to move, continue to go through the motions like a zombie. And there's a lot of splitting going on. The enemy becomes diabolical, demonic, worthy of extermination, extinction and eradication regardless of any human uh, considerations, let alone legal or criminal considerations. I mean, you just, you just need to kill this thing out there that is no longer human in your eyes and threatens your life on a constant basis because it is evil. This, of course, provokes alloplastic defenses, inability to take responsibility for what you've done, because if you do, the trauma will be all-consuming and destroy you from the inside. So you deny it. It wasn't my fault. I had to do it. I had to do it to protect myself, to protect my bodies, to protect the, the country, whatever. So there are a lot of alloplastic defenses involved. At some point, you simply give up on acting human. And you defy. You defy the defenders or the terrorists. You defy the situation. You defy your own commanders. You challenge your fate and destiny to a duel. Say, I'm going to do whatever the heck I want. I'm going to act out. I'm going to crazy make. I'm going to defy you. I'm going to, in your face, in your face, challenge my own mortality. Let's see who wins. And this leads to behavior that is very risky and often leads to death. At a point where you say, I no longer care. See if I care. I'm going just I'm gonna I'm going out there and I'm gonna shoot like crazy everywhere. I'm gonna spray the whole compound. I don't care. 
The minute you say, I don't care, you don't, you're lost. And there's a moral collapse attendant upon it. You're no longer a moral agent or a moral person. You act more like a predator, an animal. All the veneer of civilization melts down, dissipates, and what's left is animal versus animal. You look like an animal. You haven't, you haven't showered in days. You're caked with mud and sweat and blood. You're terrified inside. Your eyes peer through the mud cake mask and they're demented. You look like a deranged escapee from a mental asylum. And all you can think of is how to kill, kill, kill. You become a killing machine and you develop magical thinking. There's all kinds of super superstitions, talismans, mascots, uh, sentences you have to repeat to yourself, a sequence of, and this is a sequence of activities which will kind of isolate you, offend you, or defend you from bad happenings. This is obsess obsessive compulsive. These are obsessive compulsive rituals. The only defense you're left with, primitive, against the horror that you find yourself embedded in and perpetrating. Because perpetrating also bears a mental cost. This, ladies and gentlemen, is urban warfare. warfare. And should Israel invade Gaza, full-scale invasion, this is what awaits both the Israeli army and Hamas fighters. None of them will be spared the agony of fighting and then the agony of recalling the fighting and the trauma that will never leave them for life.